Stories from Parliament. Votes for Women, Part One. Deeds not words. Deeds not words. Deeds not words. That was our cry. That day in 1909, we suffragettes were marching to Parliament to demand the vote for women. That women, as well as men, should be allowed to vote in electing our government. Our Prime Minister, Mr. Asquith, had promised it should be so. But now he'd had second thoughts. He feared that too many women might vote against his party and bring his government down. So he did precisely nothing. Deeds not words. Deeds not words. That cry of ours meant two things. Instead of mere promises that the vote would be given to women, we wanted the government to do as they'd said. And if they wouldn't, then we were willing to act as well as speak in protest. We'd come from our meeting in a nearby hall, and the words we'd heard from our movement's leader, Mrs. Pankhurst, were still ringing in my ears. We shall be marching to Parliament, not as lawbreakers. But because women should be lawmakers. My name is Constance Lytton. My full name is Lady Constance Bulwer Lytton. Some people thought it strange that I, from a family of the ruling class, should ever have been a part of such a crowd. But Mrs. Pankhurst was a well-born lady too, and listen to what she said next. A society that allows women no part in decision making cannot flourish. Beyond the home, what lives are we permitted? Important posts are barred to us in all professions. Posts in government are just for men. Yet all their decisions affect women. They must either do us justice by giving us the vote, or do us violence. <laughs> When we reached the Houses of Parliament, lines of policemen barred our march. Some women broke through and chained themselves to the railings by the entrance. Meanwhile, I was still outside, wedged by the crowd behind me, nose to nose with a policeman. Back, back, keep back. I'm only doing my duty. Yes, and we are doing ours. You should be ashamed of yourselves. Go home, the lot of you, and behave like women. Like women? Yeah. Get home and do the washing. I must see Mr. Asquith. I mean to see the Prime Minister. I don't think so. You're coming with me.、Uh. And I was marched to the nearest police station, and from there to court, where I was sentenced to a month's imprisonment. And it was there. In Holloway Prison, that I truly realised why our cause was so important, why women had to be allowed to vote to change things. For now, I was mixing with women whose lives we could improve, women without money for their children's food, and even if they found work, their pay was half that of a man's. I remember on my very first night, the prison chaplain came to my cell. I'm surprised that a lady of your class feels the need to interfere in politics. I am a woman. What women face in life is not understood by men. Yet men are the only lawmakers. So they are.、Uh, so women's concerns are always put to one side, forgotten.、Uh, I didn't come here to discuss your views. Here, I'm told you may have these. What? Letters from my family. Indeed. But prisoners are not allowed to have them. Oh, I think we can make an exception in your case, my lady. I want no privilege. You prefer to stay in all this stink. Stink. Yes, that is the right word. There's no air in here. Indeed, there isn't. How will you bear it, my lady? I'm not sure I will. And we are condemned to this. Merely for demanding the vote. Votes for women. Votes for women. But I have a confession. 
Because I have a heart condition, I gave in. I finally accepted the offer and spent most of my month out of the stink and in the prison hospital. I was ashamed of myself. I decided that as soon as I was released, I'd be marching with the suffragettes again. And if it landed me in prison a second time, I'd make sure I was offered no special treatment. I would suffer whatever the others suffered. For I would go not as Lady Lytton, but as an ordinary working woman. My treatment so far had been bad enough. But worse, much worse, was to come. What are human rights? The respect for human rights is a central feature of a constitutional democracy. Human rights protect us against the actions of those who exercise power over us and help us to create a world in which we can all reach our full potential as human beings. We are entitled to have our human rights protected and promoted simply because we are human beings and deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. This means whatever our nationality, place of residence, sex, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, language, or any other status, we are all entitled to fundamental human rights. Because of South Africa's apartheid history, the protection of human rights is specifically important in this country. Before 1994, the most basic rights of the majority of South Africans were not respected by the state. We decided as a nation to protect the human rights of all when we became a democracy, to ensure that no one is subjected to the infringement of our rights and the denial of their human dignity ever again. The protection of human rights in South Africa draws inspiration from the global human rights movement which started after the Second World War and culminated in the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations General Assembly in 1948. Human rights follow three core principles which describe how these rights work and apply. Firstly, our rights are inalienable. That means that our rights will always apply to us simply because we are human. They cannot be taken away from us by anyone. Our rights will not change even if our life circumstances change. The second core principle is interdependence. That means that our rights come as a full package. This is because the protection of some rights depends on the protection of other rights. Our human rights support one another and strengthen one another. The third core principle is equality and non-discrimination. That means that every person enjoys the same set of rights. This is a core principle in our South African context. Rights apply equally to everyone. In a democracy like South Africa, human rights are guaranteed by the country's constitution. The constitution is the supreme law of the country. One of the most important parts of our constitution, as far as ordinary people are concerned, is Chapter 2, the Bill of Rights. Our South African Bill of Rights outlines different groups of human rights. First of all, it gives a number of basic rights. They include the right to equality before the law, the right to life, and the right to human dignity. The Bill of Rights then goes on to talk about civil rights, which are the rights that a person has as a member of a community, state, or nation, so they are linked to citizenship. Examples of civil rights include the freedom of religion, belief, and opinion, and the freedom of expression. 
Then we further have political rights, which include each citizen's right to make political choices, such as forming or campaigning for a political party, and the right to vote in free and fair elections. What is special about our Bill of Rights in South Africa is that it also focuses on socio-economic rights. Examples are the right to housing, the right to education, the right to health care, food and water, and the right to social security. Not all countries commit themselves to these rights. These rights place a special duty and responsibility on our government. They are very important because a large part of the struggle for freedom was about improving the lives of the majority of the people. So these are the different groups of human rights in our Bill of Rights. The Bill requires the state to respect, protect, promote and fulfill these guaranteed rights. But we citizens not only have rights, but obligations too. The same values that protect us have to guide how we treat one another in society. So remember, we too have the responsibility to respect these rights at all times. Even if we do not like another person, it is our duty to respect his or her rights. You can see this easily if you think about a specific right, like the right to basic education. It means that you are free to go to school, but it also means that you should not prevent anyone else from going to school. The Bill of Rights also applies to relations between all individuals and relations between individuals, the government, and private institutions. Now, why are human rights so important? Human rights are a central feature of any constitutional democracy. In South Africa, our human rights are outlined in the Bill of Rights, which is found in Chapter 2 of our Constitution and forms the cornerstone of our democracy. It is supposed to ensure that we all enjoy the protection of the democratic values of human dignity, freedom, and equality before the law. Ethical decision-making, choosing between the self and the other. When talking about ethical decision-making, one has to be aware that there are two ways of approaching this process. The individualistic approach, or where a person is responsible for his or her own decision-making, and consideration is given first to how it affects the self, rather than the other. There is also what might be called the communal approach, or where members of communities are partially responsible for the behavior of their members, and thus make decisions based on that view. Consider the debate about the legalization of drugs. Advocates argue that they have an individual right to do with their body as they please. A more communal approach would ask them to look beyond the individual and reflect on issues of public safety and the potential harm to others. In addition, when the interests of the larger community are included in any debate, solutions can be offered. What kind of drug policies will promote the good of both the individual and the community? It can only lead to a greater understanding of the issue for both sides. Should the self or other come first when making decisions? The conflict between individual and community is not easily reconciled. Anthropologist Colin Turnbull has written about the Mbuti pygmies of the Congo. The Mbuti have long employed nets of twined liana bark to catch their prey, sometimes stretching the nets for 300 feet. As Turnbull came to understand, Mbuti hunts were collective efforts in which each hunter's success belonged to everybody else. But one man, a rugged individualist named Sifu, had other ideas. When no one was looking, Sifu slipped away to set up his own net in front of the others. Word spread among camp members that Sifu had been trying to steal meat from the tribe. And a consensus quickly developed that he should answer for this crime. Sifu defended himself with arguments for individual initiative and personal responsibility. He felt he deserved a better place in the line of nets. The tribe responded that if that were the case, Sifu should leave and never return. The Mbuti have no chiefs. They are a society of equals in which redistribution governs everyone's livelihood. Faced with banishment, a punishment nearly equivalent to a death sentence, 
Sifu relented. This ended the matter, and members of the group pulled chunks of meat from Sifu's basket. Among the Mbuti, as with most hunter-gatherer societies, equality is a system that enhances individual freedom. Following these ethical rules helps prevent any one individual from taking advantage of others, or even dominating the group as a whole because of unequal privileges. However, just as it is in our society, the negotiation between the individual and the group is always a work in progress. There are times when our willingness to consider both the good of the individual and the good of the community still leaves us in a dilemma, and we're forced to decide between competing ethical claims. Affirmative action programs, for example, bring concerns over individual justice into conflict with concerns over social justice. How does one decide? When facing such dilemmas, the weight we assign certain values will sometimes lead us to promote the common good. At other times, our values will lead us to decide on actions that will protect the interests and rights of the individual. But perhaps the greatest challenge in discussions of ethical decision making is to find ways in which paradigms are designed to promote the interests of both.
If I get lost, I'm the one to blame Cause I keep finding myself on Hudson Lane. Oh, this is, I'm so excited about this study. We're, it's a study that a lot of people want to do for a long time. Uh, most people know that homeschooling has gone from, in the 1970s, almost extinct, maybe only 15,000 children homeschooled, to by this year, it's over 2 million, probably around 2.4 million K-12 students are being homeschooled. Now, in the last 10 years, we've also seen a major change. Up until then, homeschooling in, in America was very much white Anglo. So it was disproportionately white Anglo families homeschooling. But what a lot of us researchers have seen and people have experienced is that more and more, uh, minorities are homeschooling, whether they're blacks, uh, Hispanics, uh, more people are coming to homeschooling for a lot of reasons. So in this study, the plan was to study um, families who are homeschooling. Uh, these are black children. Both of the parents are black or African American. I wanted to make it a very tightly controlled kind of situation. We got families from all over the United States and we did brand new fresh academic achievement testing. So that's the setting for the families. Uh, we gave a questionnaire to the parents and then we tested the children. And these children are in grades four to eight, roughly ages nine to 14. We have brand new testing by qualified test administrators. Why did they homeschool? The parents told us their main reasons for homeschooling, I'll just read the top five. Number one, they prefer to teach their children at home so they can provide a particular religious or moral instruction. 78% uh, of them said this is one of the reasons why they homeschool. The second most common reason they mentioned was for the parents to transmit particular values, beliefs, and worldview to their children. Almost as many said that, 77%. The third was to develop stronger family relationships between children and children and parents and children. Uh, the fourth main reason they said was to customize or individualize the education of each child. That is, considering each child's strengths, weaknesses, uh, dreams, desires, they thought they could do that better than in an institutional school. And then the fifth main reason was to accomplish more academically than in a conventional school. So what do we find regarding the academic achievement of these black homeschool students? Now, in research in general on homeschooling, homeschooled children do better, quite a bit better, than the national average in public schools. So almost everybody knows this now, and that's what we keep consistently finding. But people wonder, but yeah, but what about black families? You know, after all, almost everybody knows in public schools that uh, black children are at the very bottom of the totem pole on average on academic achievement tests. Uh, first of all, these homeschooled black children did better on average. Get this, black children are doing as well or better than white Anglo children in public schools. And number two, they did far better than black children in public schools. So what exactly were the scores? Uh, for the black homeschool students, their average percentile in reading was a 68th percentile. That's percentile, that's not percent correct and for black public school students, 25. So 68 versus 25. In language, the black homeschool students were the 56th percentile compared in the public schools, 30th, 3-0. And in mathematics, the homeschooled black children were the 50th, 5-0 percentile. In the public schools, the black children were the 28th or 28th percentile. These are huge differences, no matter how you look at it. Those are the basics that we found. Uh, all of the research will be out in detail in the publication in the academic peer-reviewed journal, the Journal of School Choice, and I'm hoping you will read it.
Hi people, welcome to my channel. I'm back again with another interesting video and in this particular video I'm going to talk about do's and don'ts that you must keep in mind if you are writing a research paper or if you are a part of PhD. Now the rules that I'm going to talk in this video applies also to the people who are either in their MPhil or who are writing MA dissertation. Now I would also like to mention here is that I have made a lot of other videos on the same topic in the past few weeks. I have talked about how to choose a topic for your research paper or PhD. I have made a video about PhD entrance. I have also talked about how to write a PhD thesis and also how to plan a research proposal. All these videos are collectively combined in a playlist so that it becomes easy for you to locate it on my channel and the link of that playlist is somewhere given in the i button above. So if you have a lot of doubts, a lot of questions bubbling in your head about PhD, about research, about uh, choosing a research topic then that's the uh, playlist which will help you and I'm pretty sure that after going through those videos you will find that I have answered almost all your questions and doubts. If you have any any further questions, any further doubts, feel free to put that in the comment section below and I'll be more than happy to make further videos on those topics. Now in this video I'm going to address some important rules that you must keep in mind if you are writing a PhD thesis. Now I have seen that a lot of students are unaware of these rules because of which their PhD is rejected at the end. The first important rule that you must keep in mind is that there's a difference between academic writing and creative writing. PhD or research is not a creative writing field. It is academic writing, absolute academic writing. Now what is the difference between creative writing and academic writing? Creative writing is imaginative in nature. You can talk about anything and you can, you know, uh, make your imagination fly and you can create characters, you can use symbols and imagery and metaphors in order to, you know, uh, talk about uh, the topic in a very, very different manner. On the other hand, academic writing is very technical in nature. It is not subjective. Subjective means according to your own interpretation. No, it is a very objective writing, impersonal writing. And it has a fixed form, a fixed format. Unlike creative writing, which has a flexible format. You can write in the way you want to write. But a PhD thesis or research paper has a particular format which you must follow. I have already talked about a particular format of research proposal and PhD thesis in my uh, previous videos. You can refer to those videos if you wish to know more about them. So the first important thing that you should avoid is to indulge in a PhD or research paper and write it in a creative manner. It has to have a perfect format. Whenever you are using idea from any particular writer, any past research, you need to quote it and you need to give the source. You cannot say that, okay, this is how I'm going to write and I'm going to take credits to myself. No, if you have used any idea of any particular writer or theorist, you need to mention the source. Only then you can keep yourself away from plagiarism. The next important thing that you must remember is organizing your material. Now, PhD takes around three years to complete. Now, if you have enrolled yourself in PhD, you would be reading a lot of material in this period of three years and you would be using all these materials in your PhD thesis. I have seen a lot of students who work on feminism and then they see some uh, newspaper advertisement or television advertisement which they would like to quote in their uh, their particular research but then uh, why, while they are writing the research they forget to mention the source and then they find out that their research has been rejected because of plagiarism. Now it is important for you to always keep in mind that whatever you are going to read in the period of three years all these uh, material should be collected at a place so that when you are writing your first draft of your thesis you can mention the source when you are mentioning about the uh, particular writer or particular work. 
Suppose if you are doing your research on feminism and uh, one day you were just reading the newspaper Times of India and while you were reading you came across a very good article in the editorial section written by Namita Gokhale. You read it and you found out okay fine I can use these ideas in my PhD thesis as well and you did not make a note of that particular article. The day when you are writing the first draft and you are using the ideas of Namita Gokhale, you felt like quoting it, that I have taken it from this particular source, but then the newspaper is lost. Now you don't know which date was it so that you can get an e-copy and then you can quote the source and then you find that you have to either delete the paragraph which was very good in case of your research or you will further need to twist the language so that you don't find yourself accused of plagiarism. If on the other hand, a student has the habit of collecting information, keeping it in folders so that he can later use it to quote wherever required in the thesis, the student is going to find much easier to do PhD. I'm currently enrolled in a PhD program and I have a habit of clicking photos of all the material that I read. Suppose I'm reading an article on newspa newspaper and I find it really good and relevant in case of my PhD. So I would just click a picture and save it in Evernote. Evernote is an app which will let you to create folders so that you can put all these articles, uh, put all these photos in different different folders and categorize them according to your own need. And when I would be writing my first draft, I would have a lot of source material which I've read in a period of one, one and a half years and I can use all that material in order to write the first draft and it will become so easy for me to write the first draft. Because you will be reading a lot of stuff in one or two years of your PhD and when in the third year you would be drafting all these things, you will find that you have forgotten almost all the information. So if you want to keep yourself away from this particular uh, problem, have a habit of organizing your stuff at one place. It can either be a folder, a hard folder where you can just keep photocopies of the material or it can be a software or a soft copy app where you can keep all the images of all the sources you're reading. Uh, suppose if you're doing a research on feminism and you saw a very good ad on television and you felt that you can quote that ad so why don't click a video of that app and, see, uh, and uh, keep it in your Evernote app. So once you keep it, while, while you'll be writing the first draft, you can use that uh, advertisement in order to highlight another important uh, facet of feminism in India. And that is going to make your research even more beautiful, even more authentic. The next important mistake that I have seen students committing in their PhD is excessive quotations. I have seen a lot of PhD thesis where uh, the entire thesis chapters are filled with quotations. One after the other, the student has just quoted from different different sources. If you look at such a PhD, you will find out that it is not an original work. You have just quoted from different sources and it's an amalgamation of different PhD researchers. You have nothing original in there. So it is important that you keep quotes to bare minimum. Quotes are only for authentication. If you're using an idea from a source, you need to quote it. But then it should always be followed by your own interpretation. It's a uh, rule in PhD that from one particular source, you cannot quote more than 800 words. If you're reading an entire book on feminism, which is somewhere around 300 pages long, from that entire book, you're not allowed to quote more than 800 words in your PhD thesis. So make sure that your thesis is an original work. It has quotes for authentication, but then every quote is followed by your own interpretation. And quotes should not be so long that the researcher and as well as the other members who are associated in the jury later on finds out that there is nothing original in this work and they would reject it because it doesn't fulfill the purpose of research. A lot of time I've seen students unaware of the fact that how they need to do PhD or how they need to write a research paper. Now, if I simplify the process, it can be divided in two parts. The first part is reading a lot of study material on the topic you're doing your research. So you need to read a lot of 
primary sources as well as secondary sources material. Suppose you are doing research on Mahesh Dattani and Girish Karnar, so definitely you need to first read the plays that you have selected for the research. After that, you need to also read a lot of critical works on these two writers or on the theories uh, which you are using in order to interpret these two writers. So the first part in any research would include reading a lot of material and while you are reading you need to organize all the material so that in the second part you can use the material which you have read. So the first part would include reading and understanding and interpreting things. The second part would include writing down your findings, your conclusion. So after you have read the plays of Mahesh Dattani, Girish Karnad, you have read a lot of critical works on them, newspaper articles, maybe you have referred to a few TV shows or you have referred to a few uh, research papers which were earlier written on these two writers. You then sit down to write your research paper based on your findings. And when you write your research paper, the first draft should include everything that comes in your mind. Whatever you've studied, you can keep on writing everything that you have in your mind. That becomes the first draft. Now, after you've written the first draft, you need to revise that first draft. Once you read the first draft again, you will find that you've included a lot of repetition. You have included a lot of duplication. So just remove the repetition and duplication trim the sentences, make it simpler. One very important thing to note here is that academic writing or research writing needs to be as simple as it can be, as precise as it can be. Rather than using a word visualize, it's always better to use the word view. And rather than using the word view, it's always better to use the word see in your research. All the three words more or less mean same, but rather than using complicated words like visualize, always use similar simple words, monosyllabic words like see. And that is what will make your research specific and authentic. So make sure that you know the research process. First is reading, organizing the source material and then is writing down your interpretation, revising it again and again till the time it becomes simpler, authentic and precise. And finally, the last important thing to note is to follow a format. There are two major formats which are followed in research in India. One is MLA, Modern Language Association, and the other one is APA, American Psychological Association. Now, these two formats can be used in order to quote okay, in your entire research. There's a particular format of quoting things. If you are quoting a newspaper article, it needs to be quoted in a particular manner. If you are quoting a book, then it needs to be in a particular format. If you are quoting a TV show, then it needs to be a particular format. A YouTube video needs to be presented in a format. So throughout the research, make sure that you use any one of these formats. Either you stick to MLA and everywhere you go by what MLA 8th edition says or you go by APA format. Okay, that's up to you, but make sure that you don't mix these two things. At places you are following APA, at places you are following MLA. That is not going to make your research authentic. Either stick to MLA or to APA. So in this video, I highlighted five important rules that you must have in mind if you are doing research in field of English literature. The rules that I have given here is valid for MA dissertation, PhD, MPhil or in case of any research paper that you are writing. I hope that this video was able to clear some of your doubts related to how to go about with the research. I have already given you the link of a playlist where a lot of other videos on PhD is given. You can also visit my website arpitakarva.com and check out for the list of writers which are very important from net point of view. If you are struggling with UGC net English literature preparation, then you can also join the online course that is that we are running on our website. Uh, apart from that, you can also follow us on different social media platforms so that you can participate in the free GoNet quiz and also get updated about the recent notifications of UGC and NTA. If you have not yet subscribed to YouTube channel, I think it's time to do so because I would be uploading a lot of 
other important videos related to UGC net are uh, related to paper one paper two research so if you are really enthusiastic about studying and teaching people then this is the channel for you you can also put your doubt or your questions in the comment section below and I would never mind if you would like and share the video with your friends so that's it for this video lecture we'll meet soon in the next video lecture Till the time we meet next, happy learning, keep loving literature, stay tuned to arpatakarwar.com. If I say the phrase personality disorder, what do you think of? Psychopaths and serial killers? People like John Gacy or the fictional Patrick Bateman from American Psycho? Even those who are well-versed in psychological disorders like depression, anxiety, and schizophrenia may have a shallow understanding of personality disorders, which can contribute to the stigmas that are attached to them. And while psychopathy falls under a particular personality disorder, Antisocial Personality Disorder, there are actually 10 personality disorders in the DSMV. If you're interested in learning more about personality disorder, we're sharing a quick crash course for you. Personality disorders are defined as a type of mental disorder in which your thinking, functioning, and behavior are rigid and unhealthy. These unhealthy traits can cause significant problems and limitations in relationships, social activities, work, school, and other situations. The DSM sets out criteria for 10 personality disorders, and these disorders are grouped into three clusters or categories, clusters A, B, and C. Cluster A is considered the odd eccentric cluster and consists of paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, and schizotypal personality disorder. People in this cluster often behavior in strange ways and may in particular struggle with social situations. Paranoid personality disorder. Have you ever had feelings of paranoia or assumed someone walking behind you was following you? For someone with paranoid personality disorder, they often have extreme feelings of paranoia. They feel everyone is out to get them and are hyper aware of danger. They mistrust others and often don't get close to people for fear that person will hurt them. Schizoid personality disorder. Do you know someone who is a bit of a loner or who seems detached from others? People with schizoid personality disorder take the idea of being a loner to the extreme. It is characterized by social detachment and restricted emotions. They prefer solitude to others' company, but they tend to miss social cues and come across as cold or aloof. Schizotypal personality disorder. This one is similar to schizoid with one key difference. Do you know someone who believes in odd things? Fairies, magic, Things that are otherwise considered strange? One of the key features in schizotypal personality disorder is the so-called magical thinking. They are often awkward in social situations, much like those with schizoid personality disorder, but also experience perceptual and cognitive distortions, as well as displaying erratic behavior. This personality disorder is likable to the more well-known condition, schizophrenia. They are very closely linked with a lot of overlap. One movie that portrays schizophrenia, which we recommend, is the movie A Beautiful Mind from 2001. Due to the overlap, this gives you an idea of what people with a schizotypal diagnosis are like. Cluster B is considered the dramatic cluster and consists of borderline personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, and antisocial personality disorder. People in this cluster often behavior in dramatic ways, which can lead them to struggle to maintain stable relationships. Borderline Personality Disorder Do you have a friend who seems to switch opinions on people very quickly or experiences mood swings and instability? These are key features of the next personality disorder, which seems to be the most common. People with borderline have a big problem with instability, both in moods and in their sense of self. They may also tend to engage in risky, impulsive behaviors like drugs and self-harm. Seeing the world in black and white can also influence them to engage in splitting, 
which is when their feelings towards a person swings drastically. Borderline personality disorder is portrayed in the film Girl Interrupted. The main character is diagnosed with borderline personality disorder after a suicide attempt, and the film focuses on her stay in a mental institution. Histrionic personality disorder. We all know someone who loves being the center of attention, right? And thrives in the spotlight? People with histrionic disorder take this to the extreme. They tend to excessively show their emotions and are very uncomfortable when they are not the center of attention. They also tend to be easily influenced by others' opinions. People who love to be the center of attention at parties, in class, or other situations could be suffering from this disorder. Are you enjoying this video? We run a quarterly magazine which is currently running a mini-series on personality disorders. To find out more, check out the Patreon, www.patreon.com slash psych2go-magazine, and our store, www.psych2go.shop. Narcissistic Personality Disorder This is a term we've all heard. People talk about having met narcissists in their lives very often, but what does it mean to truly have narcissistic personality disorder? Narcissistic personality disorder sufferers have an inflated ego. They feel they are somehow special and unique. They also tend to be preoccupied by fantasies of power and have a powerful sense of entitlement. They are devastated by normal human limitations and their self-worth can rapidly fall if they encounter these limitations. There are a few characters with a diagnosis of this in film, but there are many characters who could fit the bill. For example, Miranda Priestly in The Devil Wears Prada or Aldous Snow in Forgetting Sarah Marshall have been suggested by some to have NPD. You also find articles on NPD, often portraying narcissists as abusers. It's important to remember not all people with NPD are abusive, and not all abusers have NPD. Antisocial Personality Disorder This is another personality disorder people have often heard about. You might have heard it by the names psychopathy and sociopathy. The main issue in antisocial personality disorder is an utter lack of empathy. They tend to disregard others' feelings and can often engage in criminality. They also tend to be impulsive and typically don't feel remorse for their actions. As previously mentioned, serial killers such as John Gacy or fictional killers such as Patrick Bateman are examples of people with antisocial personality disorder. However, not all people with antisocial personality disorder go on to become killers or even break the law. Cluster C is considered the anxious cluster and consists of avoidant personality disorder, dependent personality disorder, and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. People in this cluster often behave in very anxious ways, impacting on their lives greatly. Avoidant personality disorder. Do you know someone who seems to completely avoid others or who's sensitive to criticism and feels rejected often? These are some of the key characteristics of avoidant personality disorder. The individual may be extremely sensitive to criticism and have chronic fear of rejection. Due to this, they tend to completely avoid social situations and social relationships. Like with schizoid personality disorder, they often come across as a loner, but unlike schizoid personality disorder, they have no desire to make friends. They have a chronically low self-esteem and don't feel good enough. They may be a student in your class who never seems to contribute, or a coworker who takes every bit of criticism to heart. Dependent Personality Disorder Do you know someone who seems to depend on others, who needs a lot of attention and care from people? As the name suggests, people with dependent personality disorder have a strong need to be taken care of. They often come across as very clingy, and they intensely fear losing their relationships in their lives. You might have heard people say they have codependent relationships. This very well could fall under Dependent Personality Disorder. Obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder we all know a perfectionist who likes to get their own way. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder is like this, but to the extreme. Those with obsessive compulsive personality disorder are obsessed with order, control, and getting things done right. They are extreme perfectionists and struggle to work with others as they think everything should be done their way. They also tend to be tight with money, worrying about future events. No. This is different to obsessive compulsive disorder, which is an anxiety disorder. Which personality disorder did you find the most interesting? Would you like to know more about any of the disorders we discussed today?
feel free to like and share this video and subscribe to our channel for more content. You know, I wasn't sure about this book, about how civilization arose due to alcohol, but I'm really glad that I gave it a shot. After World War II, crime rates slowly but drastically increased in the United States. Theft, larceny, violent crime almost quadrupled since the 1970s. But in the 1990s, that trend reversed suddenly. Across the board, in every category you might imagine, crime rates plummeted and have continued to decrease. There have been numerous explanations proposed for this abrupt reversal. Immigration, the use of crack cocaine, legalization of abortion, number of police officers, any or all of these factors may have contributed to the climb and drop in criminal activity. But one theory paints a particularly dramatic picture of the event with profound implications. Lead is a very useful element used in all sorts of industrial processes and commercial products. Batteries, ammunition, weights, that vest that you wear during x-rays to protect your bits, and stained glass windows all use it in various forms. Unfortunately, it also has some nasty properties when introduced into the body. And no, I'm not just talking about getting shot. Absorbing lead via ingestion or aspiration of airborne particles can lead to all sorts of health problems. It's carcinogenic. It causes headaches, fatigue, loss of appetite, memory loss, nausea, vomiting, high blood pressure, pain in the joints and abdomen, and eventually death. But that stuff only happens at relatively high concentrations. You'd have to be very unlucky or very foolish to be exposed to lead in the quantities that would result in those sorts of symptoms. The much more insidious and dangerous problem is what lead exposure does to growing brains. Some lead ions have a charge of plus two, like calcium, one of the primary chemicals in the human nervous system. It can take the place of calcium in some of those reactions, which can affect the processes that build the brain over time. Children who absorb even minute quantities of lead can have significant physiological differences in how their brains develop, and significant behavioral changes as a result. As they grow, children exposed to lead tend to have issues with inhibition and emotional regulation, which can manifest as social aggression. They're at increased risk for attention disorders, which might be part of why they have lower IQs. There's evidence showing correlations between childhood lead exposure and a whole slew of negative life outcomes. Things like substance abuse problems and poor performance at work. Obviously, there's a great deal of variance in the ultimate result, but there's a massive body of research suggesting that exposing children to trace amounts of lead can be disastrous. Prior to legislation like the Lead-Based Poisoning Prevention Act of 1971, lead was used in many places which would subject children to its many neurological effects. Paints, furniture, and most notably, leaded gasoline which was great for engine performance and efficiency, flooded the environment with lead. We can test for lifetime lead exposure by examining bone marrow, and sure enough, people who grew up during those years where lead was prevalent, especially people from dense urban environments with lots of cars and apartment complexes with tons of lead-based paint, have a higher concentration of lead in their bones than children born a generation after the legislation went into effect. It starts to seem plausible that the decades-long trend we saw in crime might be due, at least in part, to the effect of lead exposure on children's brains. Okay, but as we've noted, all sorts of other crazy stuff was happening in the world at the same time. Why should we give a second thought to such an unconventional explanation when more traditional arguments about things like culture, economics, and politics might be just as valid? Well, leaded gasoline wasn't immediately banned everywhere all at the same time when the legislation passed. Some states and cities, after learning of its harmful effects, implemented strict local legislation immediately, while others followed a more gradual plan for slowly phasing it out. We can track crime rates in those regions and compare them, and sure enough, it seems that the faster your town got rid of lead, the faster that drop in crime occurred. Using analytical techniques like this, some researchers have argued that lead exposure is the largest part of the rise and fall of crime rates between the 70s and the 90s. By some estimates, it accounts for as much as 90% of the variance. The thought that simply adding lead to our gas may have resulted in decades of suffering 
that the whole nation's average IQ was lowered by a few points, that a huge number of people who would have otherwise been responsible citizens became criminals solely because they were poisoned as babies. It's a big idea. The lead crime hypothesis certainly has critics who think that attributing such a massive social trend to such a narrow cause is misguided, but I don't think that anyone would argue that we should start letting our gas again. What's particularly fascinating to me is the idea that societal and cultural changes might be the result of introducing or removing certain chemicals from the environment. Usually when we're thinking at that scale, we're appealing to abstract high-level causes and influences, things like ideologies, religions, philosophies, big concepts that change the way that people think about the world and their place in it. We don't usually consider the ambient concentration of a particular element as the determining factor in the rise and fall of civilizations. But when you start to think along those lines, you get some interesting results. Stephen Johnson, historian and author of Where Good Ideas Come From, has pointed out that the age of enlightenment seen by many as the origin of modern scientific and rational secular thought in Europe, very closely coincided with the introduction of a few beverages to the region. Coffee from the Turks and tea from India and China. Enlightenment philosophy flourished in coffee houses, with many new and interesting ideas emerging over many a 17th century cup of joe. Because they didn't yet know how to purify water, before the introduction of these newfangled drinks, Europeans tended to consume other processed beverages primarily beer, wine, and gin. Johnson highlights how they essentially transitioned from drinking alcohol, a depressant, to caffeine, a stimulant. Other cultures were drinking coffee and tea long before Europeans were, so it would be ridiculous to attribute the movement solely to the switch from downers to uppers. But again, there's a curious connection between the prevalence of certain chemicals in the environment and large-scale social trends. One has to wonder what other substances this framework might extend to. Nicotine? Mercury? LSD? Lithium? THC? Sugar? We tend to think of humans as individuals with their own agency, but we also behave as mechanisms of cause and effect in the large interconnected machine of our environment. And if you restrict the flow of, say, calories or alcohol into that machine, it's not unreasonable to think that there might be reliable consequences. What do you think of the implications of the lead crime hypothesis? What substances do you imagine having large-scale social effects due to our exposure to them? Please leave a comment below and let me know what you think. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to bubble, subscribe, blah, share. I'm generally like a pretty positive, happy person, and I like to spread positivity all around. It's like who I am. My first ever job was a restaurant hostess at a restaurant called Montana's. Um, I was essentially paid to smile to people, which I loved, you know, positivity all around. Um, most of it was like, just don't be an asshole. But uh, there were a few specific points that I do remember, um, especially at a job where we tried to help people in some way you know, empathy is key. So for example, hostesses would look at couples walking in and say, table for two, which is, you know, cute and nice. Um, but when one person comes in, you have to ask, how many people? You don't ask, table for one, or worse, just one. <laughs> you might think it's a no-brainer, but I've seen it before. Uh, now, I'm a data scope, uh, now I'm a data scientist at Datascope Analytics. We are a data science consulting firm. Now, when I tell this to people, the most common question that I get is, how did you get your job? Data science, ooh. Um, now, as a quick aside, the field data science is nothing new. Uh, people have been using quant methods, models, coding for decades, and scientific research has been using data-driven techniques for centuries. Because what's data beyond evidence? You know, uh, in science, the data show, the phrase the data show, and the phrase the evidence shows are one and the same, really. Uh, I think the use of data to solve problems is becoming more popular in industry uh, because people are actually starting to recognize its inherent value. Uh, therefore, more companies are making more of an effort to collect and store data in some smart way and finding insights from the data that they collected even before they knew how it would be useful. Uh, 
um, so there's that. But I personally got into data science because as a positive person, I wanted to help people. Um, I was like, oh cool, all these nerd skills I learned in school and I can do good for others. Using technology to drive systematic social change, oh great. Um, so coming out of school, <laughs> I wasn't sure uh, what exactly I wanted to do, but I knew that I wanted to keep that aspect of helping people, whatever that might mean. So when anyone starts working at Datascope, you brainstorm with these guys. Uh, in the first three months, you're not on client projects, you're on like a pet project. Uh, you develop something that you're really passionate about and um, as a means to learn the tools and techniques that you need. So with this toy project, here was my chance to do something good for other people. I started to develop a web app that would have a routing, uh, a routing engine for casual bikers like me who like never bike without a helmet and who like only go on like slow cruisers, you know. Uh, the primary goal was to learn specific technical skills and tools. The secondary goal was to create something that would be useful to others. Um, I never finished this project. In fact, the Inkscape SVGs that you see here probably comprise the best deliverables I ever made. And using these in this presentation is probably the most useful they've ever been. Uh, but the primary goal was achieved. I mean, I learned the technical skills that you need for, to be a data scientist. Um, but the more focused on the coding that I got, the more I forgot to be empathetic to other people and for bikers that are like me. The next project I jumped in on was this fun little thing called Lunch. It had a use case, a motivation. It was a food truck tracker two years ago. We started this project partly to avoid like the franchise fare in the loop. Um, it extracts tweets and geolocates them um, and displays them nicely on a map. When I came on, I added Hyde Park. At the time, we were also working closely with the Red Cross in a pro bono engagement, trying to improve their dispatch. Um, and offhandedly, we showed them this app, and they were like, oh, cool, something shiny and like data science-y. Let's use this. Uh, so they loved the idea and just wanted to apply it. So very quickly, we built them essentially a replica of lunch. Um, it was a Red Cross truck tracker in which drivers tweet their locations, and it would be mapped and helping them coordinate you know, across the city. Uh, before this, there was no appreciable mapping element in the Red Cross. Um, but as you can see, and these screenshots were taken uh, this week, the app hasn't been used in 11 months. They wanted it, we built it, it didn't stick. That's okay, uh, not everything is going to stick. I mean, we built it in like an afternoon or so, we didn't ask them, we didn't do um, anything other than just hack together something. But there's still an important lesson to learn here. First, it didn't integrate well into their current system. I'm not really sure that most people even use Twitter in the Red Cross. Our app was like a shiny new thing that most people thought was like a neat little shiny app, uh, but eventually they lost interest. Um, they didn't get enough out of viewing things on a map um, separate from their other you know, management tools. Uh, most importantly, we didn't empathetically design for our end user. For full project engagements, we continue to iterate and incorporate feedback from whoever's going to use the damn thing in the end. Uh, this process is what really drives our work and gets people to, to use things and, and gets them to be useful and solve the right problems. One of our more successful projects we did uh, did use this design process, um, the Chicago Energy Map. In Aaron's talk last year, he presented it in greater detail, but basically it's a partnership with uh, uh, a bunch of companies and organizations, including the City, the Civic uh, Consulting Alliance, and IDEO, and some energy companies. Um, it's an exploratory data visualization that lets you see how much energy the people of Chicago are using, both for electricity and gas usage. You can look to see how your neighborhood compares with other neighborhoods, and you can see it as detailed at, as the census block level, which is generally only up to a few dozen houses or buildings. Um, this is the front-facing portion of a larger initiative to help people improve their energy efficiency in the city. Here, we were empathetic to our end users. We listened to what they wanted. In our testing, we learned that people wanted to know how their neighborhood was doing, but that they didn't really know where it was on a map. So um, we added like the search bar and the ability to zoom and just explore. We also listened to the tech nerd end users who were like, this is cool, how'd you build it? So it's available on GitHub. We also never for uh, forgot that perhaps its primary purpose was to be an attractive face of ROM's energy initiatives and makes people informed and excited. So now it's useful in all these facets, the public face for the city, exploratory visual for residents, and an open source front end code for people to play around with. 
The point I'm trying to make is that, especially in data science where specific technical skills or build is really important, um, it doesn't matter how accurate your models are or how shiny your new app is, unless you're empathetic to the people that you're trying to help. Thank you. Ted Bundy is back in the spotlight, and with him comes renewed speculation as to why this smart, attractive, successful law student brutally murdered at least 30 people. Of course, as most of us are not deemed psychopathic, it can be difficult to understand from our perspective. Bundy did what he did partially because he lacked reason. For people like Bundy, subverting ethical norms can be reason enough. Yet, even a heart as cold as Terrible Ted's may have been at some point warm. Serial killers are created the same way as everyone else, but many things go wrong in the process. Here are eight reasons why Ted Bundy became a psychopath. 1. Genetics It's been long debated whether nature or nurture, genetics or upbringing, causes psychopathy. But nature and nurture are not in competition, they're partners. Together, they generate the antisocial traits that define the disorder. The answer, then, is both. Some killers have abnormal brain chemistry due to a defect in the MAOA gene, which causes, among other psychopathic benchmarks, hypersexuality and violent impulses. However, this genetic defect does not necessitate criminal behavior. Most people with MAOA deficiency do not become killers. This requires an extra push. 2. Trauma Here is where nurture comes into play. A handful of psychopathic murderers sustained traumatic injuries when they were children, like Albert Fish, who, at age 7, fell out of a cherry tree. As a result, Fish suffered from dizziness and headaches for the rest of his life, until he was executed for killing children. An autopsy of Ted Bundy's brain discovered no signs of trauma, but later research into MAOA concluded that Bundy might have been a victim. If this were the case, the gene's latent violence would have needed a traumatic catalyst. But trauma isn't always physical. Bundy had a childhood marred with turbulent events. When such events are experienced by someone with MAOA deficiency, a killer cocktail may result. 3. Family and Environment Nothing has more influence on a child's development than his or her family. At an early age, Bundy was entangled in a domestic conspiracy that made him believe that his grandparents were actually his parents. Not only that, but he was told his mother was his sister. His family's true identity was hidden from Bundy for many years. This was to protect the reputation of Bundy's actual mother, who was young and unwed. Bundy never knew his father. Nobody does. His identity was never determined. As a result, Bundy grew up resentful and mistrustful of the people who should have inspired absolute trust. 4. Isolation After Bundy's real mother came clean, she moved herself and Ted out of the house of lies. She wanted to give her son a fresh chance at a normal life, so she changed her identity yet again to separate her and Ted from her parents. This was further realized when she married a man named Johnny Culpepper Bundy who gave Ted the name for which he'd be known. However, Ted's mother and Johnny had four of their own children, and they monopolized their parents' attention. Ted's frustration mounted as the very person that had him unwillingly separated from his parental figures now neglected him, and as a result, he withdrew. Already pathologically shy, Ted distanced himself from his family and peers and took refuge in a fantasy world where he wasn't a powerless victim of circumstance. In his mind, he could be anything he wanted. 5. Fantasy But Bundy's fantasy could not be sustained. He needed reality to take the shape of his ideal. Like so many troubled youths, he did this by acting out. A teenage Bundy started shoplifting, breaking into cars, and peeping into windows. Ironically, this was happening while Bundy was finally succeeding at life. He had become a popular student with good grades and a few friends, but this was all part of his narrative. Bundy relished appearing like a socialite while secretly committing crimes. 
This paradoxical identity is what attracts many serial killers. The identity crisis of his youth and the impotence of his personality were what made Bundy especially susceptible to dual identity possession. 6. Rejection Despite his social success, Bundy remained insecure. He couldn't detach from the grim facts of his life, particularly the fact that he was far less wealthy than his peers. Bundy desired wealth, love, and prestige, all the conventional measures of power. Perhaps if those didn't elude him, he wouldn't have become a serial killer, just another Fortune 500 executive. It ended up being a near miss. By enrolling in university, Bundy was on the road to both wealth and prestige. And love had materialized in the form of a University of Washington classmate. Bundy adored her, but she ended the relationship, and he was devastated. His obsessive nature caused him to overreact, and he dropped out of college and chased his fantasy on high gear, using them as a bulwark against the renewed impotence of his life. At 27, Ted's ultimate fantasy became a reality when he murdered 21-year-old Linda Ann Healy, his first known homicide victim, as revenge for his unrequited love, unrequited parents, and unrequited life. 7. Manipulation Bundy, like all psychopaths, was a liar who provided false and contradictory information to manipulate others into furthering his goals. You don't know what to believe about Bundy. That's what made him so scary. Did you enjoy our analysis of Ted Bundy? Would you like to see us analyze more people in our next video? If so, be sure to support us and tell us who you would like us to analyze next. It can be psychologists, celebrities, or even real-life events you personally encounter in your life. Just send us your story, and we will do our best to provide a thorough comprehensive review of them. Until next time, hope you learned something interesting from our content that you could take away. Don't forget to subscribe and watch our other videos on psychopathy. If all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you jump too? It's the lament of many an exasperated parent, but it's also kind of a profound sociological question. Because when you're talking to your parents, the answer is always no. But with the right group of friends, you might be quite happy to take a dive in the water. The thing is, you're a different person when you're a part of a group, and you're a different person in different groups. A family, a group of friends out for a swim, a business meeting, and a choir are different kinds of groups. And the same person can be a member of all of them. So if we want to understand how these groups are different, and even how they're similar, we need to talk about what social groups are and why they matter, both to the people who are a part of them and to the people who aren't. The choir, the meeting, the friends, and the family are all examples of social groups. A social group is simply a collection of people who have something in common and who believe that what they have in common is significant. In other words, a group is partly defined by the fact that its members feel like they're part of a group. This is obviously a pretty broad definition, but it does have its limits, and you can see these limits if you compare social groups to aggregates and categories. An aggregate is a set of individuals who happen to be in the same place at the same time. All the people passing through Grand Central Station at one o'clock on a Friday afternoon are an aggregate, but they aren't a group because they don't share a sense of belonging. Categories, meanwhile, consist of one particular kind of person across time and space. They're sets of people who share similar characteristics. Racial categories are a simple example. So the sense of feeling like you belong to a group is a defining feature of a group. But it also helps you differentiate different kinds of groups, specifically between primary and secondary groups. Primary groups are small and tightly knit bound by a very strong sense of belonging. Family and friendship groups are primary groups. They're mutually supportive places where members can turn for emotional, social, and financial help. And as far as group members are concerned, the group is an end in itself. It exists to be a group, not for any other purpose. Secondary groups, however, are the reverse. These are large and impersonal groups whose members are bound primarily by a shared goal or activity rather than by strong emotional ties. A company is a good example of a secondary group. Employees are often loosely or formally connected to one another through their jobs, and they tend to know little about each other, so there's a sense of belonging there, but it's much more limited. That's not to say that coworkers never have emotional relationships. In fact, secondary groups can become primary groups over time, as a set of coworkers spends time together and becomes a primary group of friends. And while a gang of friends and a company clearly have a lot of differences, they also have at least one major similarity. 
They're both voluntary. If you belong to that group, it's because you choose to join. But there are also plenty of involuntary groups in which membership is assigned. Prisoners in a prison are members of an involuntary group, as are conscripted soldiers. Now that we understand a little bit about what groups are, we can start to study how they work beginning with group dynamics, or the way that individuals affect groups and groups affect individuals. If we want to think about how individuals affect groups, a good place to start is with leadership. Not all groups have formally assigned leaders, but even groups that don't often have de facto leaders, like parents and a family. A leader is just someone who influences other people in the group. And there are generally two types of leadership. An instrumental leader is focused on a group's goals, giving orders and making plans in order to achieve those goals. An expressive leader, by contrast, is looking to increase harmony and minimize conflict within the group. They aren't focused on any particular goal. They're just trying to promote the well-being of the group's members. And just as leaders may differ in what they're trying to do, so too can they go about doing it in different ways. I'm talking here about leadership styles, of which we have three. Authoritarian leaders lead by giving orders and setting down rules which they expect the group to follow. Such a leader earns respect and can be effective in a crisis, but at the expense of affection from group members. Democratic leaders, on the other hand, lead by trying to reach a consensus. Instead of issuing orders, they consider all viewpoints to try to reach a decision. Such leaders are often less effective during a crisis, but because of the variety of different viewpoints they consider, they often find more creative solutions to problems, and they're more likely to receive affection from their group's members. Finally, laissez-faire leaders do the least leading. They're extremely permissive and mostly leave the group to function on its own. This means lots of freedom, but it's the least effective style at promoting group solidarity and least effective in times of crisis. So leadership is one way that individuals affect groups, but groups also affect individuals. You can see this especially clearly in group conformity, where members of a group hew to the group's norms and standards. Basically, group conformity is the reason that you do jump off the bridge with your friends. And this has been demonstrated in some fascinating experimental results. So let's go to the Thought Bubble to learn about perhaps the most famous or infamous experiment on conformity. The Milgram experiment was run by American psychologist Stanley Milgram in 1974, and it was presented as an experiment in punishment and learning with two participants. One participant was the teacher, who read aloud a series of word pairs and then asked the other participant, the student, seated in another room to recall them. The student was strapped to a chair and wired up with electrodes. For each wrong answer, the experimenter, who was standing beside the teacher, instructed the teacher to deliver a painful electric shock to the student. With each wrong answer, the intensity increased from an unpleasant few volts up to 450 volts, a potentially deadly shock. But the experiment was not about punishment or learning. The student was actually an actor, a confederate of the experimenter, and the shocks were not real. The experiment was designed to test how far the teacher would go in conforming to authority. At some point in the experiment, the confederate would feign extreme pain and beg the teacher to stop. Then he fell silent. If at any point the teacher refused to issue the shock, the experimenter would insist that he continue. In the end, 65% of participants went all the way, administering the presumably deadly 450 volt shock. And this is usually given as proof that people tend to follow orders, but there's a lot more to it than that. If the experimenter gave direct orders to the teacher, like, you must continue, you have no other choice, that resulted in non-compliance. That's when the teacher was more likely to refuse. The prods that did produce compliance were the ones that appealed instead to the value of the experiment the ones that said administering the shocks was necessary for the experiment to be successful and worthwhile. So in this instance, the value of the experiment, of science, was a strongly held group value, and it helped convince the subjects to continue, even though they might not have wanted to. Thanks, Thought Bubble. This idea of group values points us to another important concept in understanding conformity, the idea of groupthink. Groupthink is the narrowing of thought in a group, by which its members come to believe that there is only one possible correct answer. Moreover, in a groupthink mentality, to even suggest alternatives is a sign of disloyalty to the group. Another way of understanding group conformity is to think about reference groups. Reference groups are groups we use as standards to judge ourselves and others. What's normal for you is determined partly by your reference groups. In-groups are reference groups that you feel loyalty to and that you identify with. But you can compare yourself to out-groups too, which are groups that you feel antagonism towards and which you don't identify with. And another aspect of a social group that can affect its impacts and dynamics is its size. And here, the general rule is the larger the group, the more stable but less intimate it is. A group of two people is obviously the smallest and most intimate kind of group, but it's also the least stable, because if one person leaves, there's no group anymore. Larger groups are more stable, and if there are disagreements among members, other members are around who can mediate between them. But big groups are also prone to coalitions forming within them, which can result with one faction aligning against another. The size of a group matters in other ways, too. For instance, in terms of social diversity, 
Larger homogenous groups tend to turn inward, concentrating relationships within the group instead of relying on intergroup contacts. By contrast, heterogeneous groups, or groups that have more diversity within them, turn outward, with its members more likely to interact with outsiders. Finally, it's worth pointing out that social groups aren't just separate clumps of people. There's another way to understand groups, in terms of social networks. This perspective sees people as nodes that are all socially interconnected. You can imagine a circle of friends who are all connected to each other in different ways, some with strong connections in a clique or subgroup, while some are connected by much weaker ties. And you can follow the ties between all of the nodes outward, to friends of friends and acquaintances who exist on the periphery of the network. Networks are important because even their weak ties can be useful. Think of the last time you were networking, following every connection you had to, say, land a job interview. Regardless of whether you think about groups as networks and ties or as bounded sets, it's clear that they have important impacts on people, both inside and outside. If you just looked at society as a bunch of individuals, you'd miss all the ways that groups impact our lives, by acting as reference groups, by influencing our decisions through group conformity, and much more. And groups are important for how society itself is organized. So next time, we're going to talk about one big part of that formal organizations and bureaucracy. For now, we've learned about social groups. We talked about what social groups are and the different kinds of groups. Then we discussed group dynamics, how individuals affect groups and how groups affect individuals. We learned about leadership, group conformity, reference groups, and the impacts of group size. And finally, we talked about groups as networks and why networks matter. Crash Course Sociology is filmed in the Dr. Cheryl C. Kinney studio in Missoula, Montana, and it's made with the help of all of these nice people. Our animation team is Thought Cafe, and Crash Course is made with Adobe Creative Cloud. If you'd like to keep Crash Course free for everyone forever, you can support the series at Patreon, a crowdfunding platform that allows you to support the content you love. Thank you to all of our patrons for making Crash Course possible with their continued support. An academic honor code or honor system is a set of rules or ethical principles governing an academic community based on ideals that define what constitutes honorable behavior within that community. The use of an honor code depends on the notion that people, at least within the community, can be trusted to act honorably. Those who are in violation of the honor code can be subject to various sanctions, including expulsion from the institution. Honor codes are used to deter academic dishonesty. The documented history of an academic honor code dates back to 1736 at the College of William and Mary and is the oldest honor code in the United States. The honor code is an enduring tradition to this day. Students administer the honor pledge to each incoming student and educate faculty and administration on the relevance of the code and its application to students lives at the college. Students administer the code through six honor councils and the Council of Chairs. The College of William and Mary founded the Phi Beta Kappa Academic Honor Society in 1776 and was the first school of higher education in the United States to install an honor code of conduct for students. The college's honor code is based upon the premise that a person's honor is his or her most cherished attribute. In a community devoted to learning, a foundation of honor among individuals must exist if that community is to thrive with respect and harmony among its members. An honor system is an ideal mechanism to ensure such a state of affairs. With it, students and faculty are afforded a freedom that otherwise may not be available. With this freedom comes each individual's responsibility to conduct himself or herself in such a way that the spirit of mutual trust which sustains the system is not compromised. The honor code applies to alleged acts of lying, stealing or cheating that adversely affect the college community, whether committed by a student on campus or elsewhere. Presently, some of the most notable and most stringent honor codes exist at the U.S. Military Academy See Cadet Honor Code, Virginia Military Institute, the U.S. Air Force Academy, the United States Merchant Marine Academy, and the United States Coast Guard Academy. 
The United States Naval Academy has an honor concept, which is similar in scope to the honor codes at the other academies. The Military Academy Honor Codes not only govern the cadets' and midshipmen's lives at the academies, but are deemed essential to the development of military officers who are worthy of the public trust. As such, the codes are not limited merely to academic situations or to conduct on campus. Cadets and midshipmen are expected to live by the code's ethical standards at all times. The codes are as old as the academies themselves and simply state that cadets and midshipmen do not lie, cheat or steal. The only single sanctioned honor code in the United States exists at the Virginia Military Institute, where a drum-out ceremony is still carried out upon a cadet's dismissal. At three of the service academies and me, anyone who learns of an honor code violation is required to report it. Failure to do so is considered toleration, which is itself a violation of the code. This also holds true at Norwich University, Texas A&M, and the Citadel where their honor codes specifically provide that all students, both cadets and civilians, do not tolerate those who do. It is notable that at these three senior military colleges which enroll both cadets and civilian students, there are two honor codes, one for cadets and one for civilians, whether on campus or through distance online programs, etc. The honor concept of the Brigade of Midshipmen at the United States Naval Academy allows the observer of an honor violation to confront the accused without formally reporting. It was found that this method was more constructive at developing the honor of midshipmen. A non-toleration clause, on the other hand, is believed to make enemies of classmates. Additionally, it is thought that one's true honor, if other than utmost, was not able to be formally remediated when hidden from public view. Under the Academy's honor codes, violators can face severe punishment, up to and including being forwarded for expulsion by the Secretary of the Army, Navy or Air Force. Stringent honor codes, however, are not limited to military institutions. The all-male Hampton Sydney College is reputed for an honor code system on a par with military systems. This code extends to all student activities both on and off campus. Off-campus violations can be prosecuted and, also like the military system, considers tolerance of a violation itself a violation. Like the Naval Academy, though, those who witness a violation are encouraged to confront the violator and convince them to turn themselves in before resorting to reporting the violation. Another school with a very strict honor code is Brigham Young University. The university not only mandates honest behavior, but incorporates various aspects of Mormon religious law, drinking, smoking, drug use, and premarital sex are all banned. Also, the code includes standards for dress and grooming. Men must be clean-shaven and men and women cannot wear short shorts or other revealing clothing. Hi guys, so today I wanted to do a video on empathy and I actually got this question from one of you guys and I want to read it for you um, because I thought this was a very, very great question that we could discuss. So the question is on my Instagram and it's from Matthew. I don't know if you want me to share your Instagram or not. So I'm just gonna read the question. But it says, do you still feel empathy for chronic alcoholic patients or whatever type of patient? I feel I felt bad for my patient last night, but a lot of the reason why, I, oh, but a lot of the reason why she was there was her own fault. I'm torn between spending the energy to still care and dissociating myself from some of my patients entirely. I feel like I'm a bad nurse for not caring, but I feel drained of emotional energy if I do care. And I thought this was a fantastic question because it's something that every nurse is going to come across and struggle with, some more than others. And I definitely struggled with this early on in my nursing career because you just care so much, especially when you're a new nurse. You want to help everyone, you want to save everyone, and then you get to the real world of nursing and you realize that there are patients, they make their own decisions, they've made their bed and they've slept in it, so to speak, and no matter if you give all of your energy and time and caring and love and support to them, they're still going to turn around and do the things that they shouldn't, i.e. if you're a chronic alcoholic or a chronic drug abuser. 
and you find yourself in this position where you've given so much of your time and energy to someone and cared so much and then you're disappointed because they don't meet this criteria or they don't succeed and you take that as a personal failure and then you just feel burnt out and a lack of energy. But then on the flip side, if you just associate yourself and you act like you don't care, then you come across as like a harsh, burnt out nurse. So finding this fine balance is tough. And so that's kind of what I want to talk about. Um, I struggled with this a lot when I first became a nurse because I just was so motivated. I want to help everyone. And then I realized that no matter how much you give of yourself to someone, they're not going to make a change in themselves unless they feel they need to make that change. And it's finding this balance between still offering emotional and physical medical support to someone and being available, but not taking that home with you and still to a certain extent putting up this wall. But it's hard because you don't want to put up so much of a wall to where you just don't care at all. Um, because I feel like no matter how long you've been a nurse, no matter how many terrible situations you've seen or patients fail or they do things, you know, you've given so much of yourself, still part of you always cares because you're always hoping to see the best in someone or the best outcome um, in your patients. And if you lose that, then it's really time to start finding another position. And I actually talked with a very, very seasoned nurse. I think she's been a nurse for over 30 years. Just yesterday on my shift, we were talking about this and I was saying, you know, I see, because I work in the ICU, I see a very, very tough position because we see a lot of people that come in, that die, that come in who've created their own issues and that are very, very sick. And there's people who live who probably shouldn't have lived. And there's people who die that shouldn't have died. And I was, I was talking to this nurse just how it's taken a while to learn how to still offer. Trauma occurs in many forms, ranging from verbal to physical and or sexual. Whether you've personally experienced abuse or have witnessed it, we want you to know that it's not your fault, nor are you alone. Not only is it hard to talk about, but it follows you even after it's over. We hope wherever you are today that you're in a safer place. Our hearts go out to anyone who's been a victim of childhood abuse. In our description box below, we've included a few hotlines in case you need to contact someone for help. As always, you can also reach out in the comment box. Here are seven ways childhood trauma follows you into adulthood. One, you can't seem to remember much of your younger years at all. Do your high school years feel like a blur? You might find yourself drawing a blank when someone brings up a childhood memory and you can't recall the same one. People with childhood trauma may experience flashbulb memories in which they remember vivid moments, but not the full event. When you look back on the past, it's made up of more black holes than fully written chapters. You might even feel like someone or something has stolen your childhood, depending on the severity of the events. Two, you find yourself in toxic relationships. If you've ever watched or read The Perks of Being a Wallflower, you'd be familiar with the quote, we accept the love we think we deserve. When you grow up in a household devoid of love and emotional support, healthy relationships are a foreign concept to you. In fact, many people who face childhood trauma often adapt the fearful, avoided attachment style, where they want emotionally close relationships, but find it hard to trust or depend on others completely. Consequently, without knowing it, you might seek destructive relationships, mistaking the mistreatment and uncertainty for excitement. 3. Or you feel like you don't deserve love at all. People who experienced abuse in their childhoods might avoid romantic relationships altogether, believing they can't be loved by others. This is known as the anxious preoccupied attachment, where the individual wants to establish emotional intimacy with others, but often fears rejection. As a result, vulnerability is usually avoided when they've only been hurt by people they once trusted. This kind of trauma doesn't just ache, it ruins you. 4. You develop passive aggressiveness. Did you grow up in a household with anger all the time? It can be so scarring that you might even grow fearful of this emotion. 
You learned at a young age that none of your emotional needs were important, so you've only resorted to burying or suppressing them. As you reach adulthood, you'll continue to exercise passive-aggressive behavior because straightforward communication was avoided when you were a child. 5. Negative self-talk is amplified. Childhood trauma gets into victims' heads and makes them believe they won't ever be good enough. It's not something they can just snap out of or fix with positivity. It's scary and real how convincing their parents might have been when their words and actions cut them deep. 6. You ride an emotional roller coaster. You might either feel too much or not enough at all. Trauma can cause a disruption in your emotional well-being. Signs include troublemaking decisions, impulsive behavior, and random outbursts of anger or frustration. 7. You don't know who you are. Identity is difficult, but it seems more impossible to grasp or pin down when you face childhood trauma. It's slippery like a fish, and the more you try to see yourself, the less you begin to recognize who you thought you were. Have you or anyone you know experienced any of these symptoms? Please share your thoughts with us below. We're an open-minded team and we will never judge you for your stories. In fact, we often find them inspiring. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more helpful tips and share this video with others. Thanks so much for watching. Good morning, Hank. It's Tuesday. So what if I told you that for Americans, a single data point can affect your life expectancy more than whether you smoke, whether you get an annual physical, or whether you exercise regularly? That data point is your zip code, the five-digit number the U.S. Postal Service uses to deliver your mail. In the U.S., your zip code can affect your life expectancy by 20 years, and according to some recent research, the gap between the healthiest communities and the sickest ones is getting bigger. So I live in the city of Indianapolis, and in my zip code, life expectancy is around 80, which is slightly higher than the U.S. average. But if you live three miles north of my house, average life expectancy rises to 83.7, and if you live three miles south of my house, it falls to 69.4. Now, maybe that doesn't seem like a big deal to you, but just to put it in some context, on average, non-smokers in the U.S. live about 10 years longer than smokers. People who exercise regularly live about 4.5 years longer than those who don't, and whether you live three miles north or south of my house affects your life expectancy by 14 years. Wait, slight tangent. Am I going to spend all of those extra 4.5 years exercising? I have to do some math. Okay, so assuming 2.5 hours of moderate intensity exercise per week beginning at the age of 16, you're going to spend about one of your extra years exercising. Then you're going to spend another 1.5 years sleeping. You basically get two extra years. Except, of course, that's not how life expectancy works. If you, a particular individual, exercise, it doesn't mean that your particular life will be increased by 4.5 extra years or even 4.5 five extra hours. It just means that on average, that's what happens. Similarly, living in a particular zip code doesn't mean a particular fate for individuals, but on average, geography has a huge impact on American health and longevity. So what's causing that profound life expectancy gap? Well, as usual, it's complicated. Like the Eastern Kentucky communities where life expectancy is under 70 have higher rates of tobacco usage than the Central Colorado communities where life expectancy is over 85. But Eastern Kentucky is also poorer and has fewer doctors. Communities with low life expectancy tend to have less access to healthy food and more uninsured people. People in those communities are also more likely to have certain chronic health problems like diabetes and hypertension, whereas the people in the healthiest communities tend to be, you know, rich and have excellent access to health care. And the zip codes with the highest life expectancy also tend to be in places where there's lots of physical activity, like ski resorts in Colorado or wealthy beach towns in California. Now, I know to many of us this is not surprising, like we take it for granted that rich people will have dramatically longer and healthier lives than poor people, but increasing inequality of life expectancy within countries is not actually the norm. In fact, while life expectancy variability has been rising within the U.S. steadily since 1980, in most other rich countries it's been declining. Canada, for instance, has seen a significant decline, which is one of the main reasons why Canada's overall life expectancy is higher than ours, even though the richest 20% of Americans live longer on average than the richest 20% of Canadians. Side note, lots of people take issue with life expectancy as a health metric, especially when comparing one country to another, and with some good reasons. But the data we're discussing here is mostly exempt from those critiques. Much more info and sources in the doobly-doo below. Right, so this growing discrepancy in life expectancy is not normal and it is not natural. We don't have to accept that lifespan will vary dramatically within a country based on where you live. But right now in the United States, that problem is getting worse, not better. That seems to me deeply wrong. I mean, our Declaration of Independence famously names three inalienable rights that Americans should enjoy. And before liberty and the pursuit of happiness, 
There is life, Hank. I'll see you on Friday. Actually, no. I will see you tomorrow for a surprise bonus Vlogbrothers video, and then I'll see you on Friday.